load. Okay. <laughs> Today we're going to be talking about red herrings and foreshadowing because of the fact that um, this is important no matter what you're writing. However, it's extra important because the next contest that we will be having will be mystery themed. And red herrings and foreshadowing are essential to making a good mystery. Um, however, mystery subplots are abundant in literature. For example, um, Harry Potter, the very first book, the mystery of who the heck is sided with Voldemort, right? And who the heck is trying to steal the stone? That's a mystery, right? And yet it's not the main plot. It is just a mystery that helps facilitate moving through the plot. So sometimes red herrings and foreshadowings can help give us that underlying mystery plot in that sense, even if that isn't the main plot. Usually there's something we're trying to discover. All right, so first we're going to talk about red herrings. Now, first of all, I want to clarify, we are not talking about fish. <laughs> there is a fish called a herring. It is not just a fish that is red. Um, no, I don't know why the term is called red herring, so I probably should have Googled it because I am curious, but a red herring is a term for when it is a fake clue or the foreshadowing is done in such a way that it seems like it's a clue and then psych, it's not. Um, it's kind of like those moments when you're reading a mystery and then all of a sudden it's like, you thought it was the mom who killed the um, stepdaughter, but psych, it was her boyfriend. Or like, I don't know. <laughs> Point is that you think it's someone else the whole time and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's not accurate. Or alternatively, you're like, I think it's so-and-so because of this. And then they're like, I had no motive for murder. And it's like, and then what does this clue mean? It means nothing. So red herring is for foreshadowing that leads to nothing or leads to the incorrect answer. It's a false clue. Um, with that being said, the trick with red herrings is you don't want to make it seem like it is someone else or seem like it is something else and then fake out your reader at the last second. If you're going to do a red herring, make sure you establish well before the climax of the story that it is a red herring. Otherwise, the reader's just left confused. It would be the equivalent of me being like, here's all of these clues that show that they're the murderer. Psych, no one was the murderer. And then you're just like, why? Why'd you do this to me? <laughs> so with red herrings, you can do them, even in a short story. But I will say that just be careful to make sure you resolve that red herring well before you reach the climax, because then the reader won't feel betrayed <laughs> and confused. We don't want them to really feel betrayed and confused. That makes them put down the book or throw the book, depending on the person. <laughs> um, next thing is to make sure that if you do a red herring and you aren't going to make it obvious before the climax, make it obvious up front. For example, if someone is being set up, and this is, it's not actually them like someone's making you think it's them but it's not them they're being framed then the best thing to do with that red herring is make it seem too obvious it's like all the clues lead directly to them exactly and then you're like but they're too smart to be this dumb <laughs> they, would they really be holding the murder weapon in a photo probably not is it photoshopped totally <laughs> you know um because sure, there are criminals who are that dumb. But if you want to do a red herring, that <laughs> um, you can always do it in such a way where it's like, this doesn't fit their character, and yet everything's pointing to it. So then the reader will be like, okay, something's wrong here. This doesn't fit. <laughs> Which either means one of two things. It doesn't fit because it's bad writing, or it doesn't fit because it's not supposed to fit. Which is what you want to go for. If you're doing a red herring that's supposed to be obvious. Now, next we're going to talk about foreshadowing. We're going to talk about foreshadowing a little bit longer, purely because of the fact that foreshadowing is a little bit more abundant. Oh, I should probably give an example of a red herring. Um, a great example of a red herring, because most people have read Harry Potter, or if you haven't, you've probably seen the movie, and if you haven't, you probably at least are aware of the basic plot. Um, <laughs> Um, I always use it for that reason, like it's not even necessarily my favorite book series, it's just everyone knows it. Um, so with red herrings, a great example of a red herring in Harry Potter is Snape in the first book, where he's all like muttering stuff in the Quidditch match, right, and Harry and um, Hermione and Ron are all like, Harry's going to die and it's Snape's fault, clearly he's casting a curse, and in reality he's trying to do an anti-curse. Um, <laughs> But because of the 
the fact that he is muttering something while Harry's room is going nuts makes it seem like it's obviously him, right? But then Red Herring, of course, it's not him because every single time that they think it's Snape, Qu um, Professor Quirrell just so happens to be in the room. And so they're just not putting two and two together and realizing that it may be Snape or it may be the person who's always with Snape. <laughs> um, so that's a great example of a Red Herring. Foreshadowing. With foreshadowing, it is best utilized when you show hints of the future so that the reader can figure it out for themselves. If you have no foreshadowing of something, that's when it feels a little bit like deus ex machina. That is Latin for God, um, God of, in the machine. And that is metaphorical for basically there was this book where the machine isn't working, the machine isn't working, the machine isn't working, and then all of a sudden God just, boop, all better. Um, <laughs> and, well, let's be real here. Um, no one likes that. <laughs> we like our characters to be able to solve their own problems, right? If you just um, read this whole book where you're like, this person so often, they're overcoming their demons and solving problems, and then all of a sudden at the last second they're like, bleh, I'm dead, and then the god just solves all of their problems for them, you'd be a little upset, right? You'd be like, what was the point of following this main character if they're just going to die and the god's going to solve all the problems for them? Um, so... That is why foreshadowing is so important, is because if you are going to have something like that happen, it's important you foreshadow it. For example, if the god is going to come in and fix everything, maybe emphasize that. Like, have them constantly be like, even with all, everything that we have, there's no way we can take down this guy. Or even with um, this specific thing, there's no way we can do it. Or maybe they have all the resources to do it, and then they waste all their resources for some reason doing something dumb. And then they're like, we, are, we could have done it maybe if we had the resources, but we lost half of our armor or something like that. Make sure there's a reason if you're going to do something like that. And that's why a good foreshadowing is important, is because then the readers don't feel cheated when you do something. Or they alternatively don't feel very confused. For example, if you're like, these two are going to fall in love, and you foreshadow that they're going to fall in love. And then all of a sudden at the end you're like, and JK, they hate each other because they're brother and sister. Everyone would be like, what? <laughs> but if you foreshadow it in such a way, then people are like, oh, good plot twist. And yes, I will say, foreshadow even your plot twists. It's not a true plot twist if it just comes out of nowhere and like, well, bam, smacks your reader in the face. That's not a plot twist. That's just smacking your reader in the face. <laughs> if you want to do a plot twist, you need to foreshadow it appropriately. I actually read this amazing book. It is very sad. Um, it is a tragedy. Um, but <laughs> it's a good tragedy because it's one of those ones where like you're crying at the end, but you're also like, but good things happen, so I can't be sad, but I'm also sad, you know. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to tell you what it is now because that would be literally spoiler for the entire novel. Um, <laughs> even just saying it's sad is spoiler. <laughs> um, but they did the foreshadowing excellently well because of the fact that it was so subtle that you almost didn't see it. And even in the spots where they made it obvious, because um, I did have a few spots where I was like, wait, this doesn't quite make sense. Let's make it a little more obvious here. What's happening? Um, because I was their editor. Um, <laughs> with the foreshadowing, even in the spots when it's more obvious, people still were floored by the plot twist because of the fact that it did it in a subtle way. When I say have a blunt foreshadowing point, I don't mean like smash your reader over the head with a shovel. Um, <laughs> I mean when it's blunt, it's kind of like it's kind of like when you're teasing your friend about something, right? You might do a subtle tease, or you might do a subtle but blunt tease, um, <laughs> but your friend is just like not even listening, and so they're oblivious. That's kind of how you want to do it with the foreshadowing with your reader, is you don't want to be like, by the way, I'm teasing you, fuck, <laughs> with your foreshadowing. That just makes your reader feel like you're being a bit aggressive. Whereas if you're like, hey, this is obviously a problem, and they're like, you're right, that is a weird thing, that's a problem, but then it's subtle enough that they just look right through it. <laughs> they don't notice the problem. Even though you pointed it out, they, they don't notice it for whatever reason. You give them a reason not to. So, for example, this particular um, character, again, spoiler, um, but, but this specific character, 
get, always gives the reason of the fact that the reason she's doing everything alone is because of anxiety. And her friends are trying to help her get over their anxiety. Um, <laughs> and so as a result, you as a reader just slide it under the rug. You're just like, oh, that makes sense. And then later when you figure out the plot twist, you're like, oh my god. Um, <laughs> with that foreshadowing in mind, um, I would say for a novel, you want three more blunt foreshadows. The reason why is because of the fact that if you are too subtle the entire time, then the reader won't catch on. It's, <laughs> it's kind of the equivalent of when you're dealing with a really oblivious person and you're trying to like tease them and they're just like, what? <laughs> and so you have to be a little, like I said, a little bit more blunt with your teasing for them to get it. Um, that's basically why you need blunt foreshadowing and subtle foreshadowing. Because the subtle foreshadowing, your readers that catch on to foreshadowing will be like, aha. But then your readers who are a little bit more oblivious will also catch on because of the blunt foreshadowing. <laughs> um, with that being said, I would say the one that you want to rely on the most is purely subtle with no bluntness. But every once in a while, a little bit of a blood foreshadow is a good thing. Um, next thing I would say is ways to foreshadow. So, first great way to foreshadow is dialogue. So this can be dialogue or it can be lack thereof. Um, for example, if your character is like, oddly quiet when someone mentions their parents. Um, maybe their parents are dead. <laughs> and that's why they're weirdly quiet. Everyone's like, my parents love me, and my parents are great. And then the person's just like, <laughs> awkward in the corner. That tells you a lot, right? Even if they don't say anything, that is good foreshadowing, because then you're going, something's wrong with their parents. <laughs> something's making me go, hmm, and squint. <laughs> Or alternatively, if they do say something, they could be very obviously lying. Like, oh yeah, my parents are so great. Um, we had pancakes last week. Um, last week you were at school and we live at a boarding school. You don't leave school. I meant before, obviously. <laughs> then that's a great way through dialogue to show that they're trying so hard to fit in, but something's off. <laughs> All right. Next, setting. You can foreshadow through the setting. Um, a great example of this is in movies, funnily enough. They do this a lot. They even mention it actually in the Harry Potter movies. If you watch the bonus features on Harry Potter movies, they'll talk a lot about the fact that they're like, hey, we had to adjust some of the details in the movie to fit with the color palette for this movie. And you're like, color palette? What? Um, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Um, <laughs> if you're confused about that, let me explain. For example, in the second book, there is Gilderoy Lockhart, the most obnoxious of all people. Um, <laughs> I've never read the book. Yeah, I'm trying to read it. <laughs> That's okay. Um, point is that he's very obnoxious and he's kind of full of himself. But in the books, he's describing as where described as wearing pastel pink and pastel blue and all of these very bright colors. Um, however, in the movies, they actually had him wear more dusty and muted colors because of the fact that they wanted to have a darker color palette for the movie because they wanted every single movie of the Harry Potter series to get a little bit darker to match the dark tone of what's actually happening. Um, and so as a result, they were like, we can't do pastel pink because we have all these like muted dark colors and then we have like pink. <laughs> and so it wouldn't fit, right? And so they tried to go with similar colors, but not the same. That's a great example of setting. If you have like a really, that's, this is why it gets cliche sometimes. You know how people have a funeral and everyone's crying and so it's raining. Um, <laughs> it can get too cliche, but you can absolutely use the setting as a sense of foreboding. You can be like, hey, there's a storm on the seas and you realize that they have to go out on their ship tomorrow or else, you know, something bad will happen. And you're like, but if they go out on the ship tomorrow, they might get caught in that storm. You know, all that kind of stuff. So, setting can be a great way to foreshadow certain events with the setting, but it can also be a great way to foreshadow what's going to happen in that book. Um, for example, how you describe something can be very important to how the story moves forward. For example, if you say, I'm sorry, my nose itches like crazy today, my allergies are nuts. Um, <laughs> for example, 
you would have a tree in your yard, right? And if the main character is staring at that tree and going, the tree swayed in the breeze, sounding like the moaning of spirits, that makes it sound much more spooky, right? With the setting. However, if that same scene is being done and they're like, the tree swayed in the breeze, creaking almost like laughter, it's doing the exact same thing, but the point of view of the character is changing the way the setting is described. Keep in mind with third person, the character is not the one doing the describing, you are. Which means that even if the character is perfectly happy, you can be like, the character thought it sounded la like, character so-and-so thought it sounded like laughter. But in reality, perhaps it was more of a moan. <laughs> and so as a result, you as the writer can kind of foreshadow to the reader, like, something bad's about to happen, even though the character doesn't know it. Something bad's about to happen. Um, that being said, let's move on to the next thing. Symbolism. So, um, just like setting can be symbolic for what's happening, you can also have physical symbols. For example, um, if you want it to come off as very sharp and scary, then have a lot of sharp and scary things in the room. Like, um, for example, if you were describing a doctor's office, right? If you wanted to describe it as cutesy, then you could use lots of symbols of like, they have pictures of cat posters and things like that. So it makes it seem more cute. Um, however, if um, the person then realizes they're super sick, and they're sitting in that same room, maybe those, that same symbol of cat posters seems a little more dreary now, and it's like a hang in there cat poster, and the person's thinking, yeah, I really do have to hang in there, <laughs> you know, like I'm really sick. Um, and so that symbol goes from being a very positive symbol to being a very negative symbol, and that can be incredibly powerful, not just for foreshadowing, but for helping your reader fully immerse themselves in that moment and in the foreshadowing of it. Um, if you were to do that more of a foreshadowing way, you could have it be like the cat posters that usually cheered me up only seem to bring me down. That is a great example of a symbol giving us a foreshadowing. Alright. And then of course, the classic dreams and visions. If you are doing um, fantasy, Dreams and visions are totally a thing you should do. Even if you're not doing fantasy, you can do this, but I will say it does seem more cliche and weird to do not in fantasy, because in fantasy it makes sense as to why it's happening, whereas if you're doing it in real life, it's like, do people really actually have dreams about, like, oracles predicting their death and then they die? Like, probably not, but some people do. I know that there is actually, a, um, supposedly, a recorded journal entry from Abraham Lincoln talking about the fact that he had a dream where all of his family was crying, and he kept trying to ask them why they were so upset, and they weren't answering him. Like, he was a ghost, and this was, like, a week before he died. Um, <laughs> so there are some things like that that can happen, but I will say if you are going to do the dreams and visions thing, more prevalent in fantasy than it is in real life. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but it is more prevalent in fantasy and more widely accepted. <clears throat> All right, last thing is timing. Don't shove foreshadowing in there if it doesn't belong. Um, the reason I say that is because, for example, in Harry Potter with the Snape thing, he is at Quidditch and it naturally occurs that Quirrell tries to kill him and Snape tries to prevent him from being killed. That is a natural timing of events. Whereas, if they were just like, oh no, Snape's trying to kill you for no random reason in the hallway, <laughs> like, that seems weird. Whereas in a Quidditch match, it's a perfectly public setting, it makes sense, it might seem like an accident, like, the timing feels right. I guess my point is, if you're going to do foreshadowing, make sure that you let it flow naturally rather than trying to shove it where it doesn't go. Foreshadowing is important, however, you don't want to shove so much foreshadowing in holes that don't belong because then the reader will just feel like, what is happening? Because <laughs> it won't fit naturally with the flow of the story. Alright, so, do you guys have any questions regarding foreshadowing or red herrings? Not particularly. Alright. Then I'm going to turn off the video. Um, reminder, <clears throat> for those of you that did or didn't get my email, the um, deadline has been extended to December 2nd. 
Um, because of the <laughs> mishap, I thought we would be open on the 30th. We are not. And so please try to get your first chapter entries in if you are going to do that by December 2nd.